my, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, David Fisher. Uh, he will speak to us, is the sound okay? Speak to us on the climate change uh, in the Arctic over the Holocene. Sorry? Okay. Better? He will speak to us today on climate change in the Arctic over the, la over the Holocene period, which is the last 12,000 years approximately. Uh, I have known David since our undergraduate years in science. Uh, let's just say at the dawn of time. Um, my knowledge of the Arctic has uh, benefited from countless uh, informal discussions with him. And, um, and, and on a few occasions uh, from the addition of some thousand-year-old ice core to our whiskey. <laughs> Maybe that's why my, uh, it remains a complex area for me. But uh, David has um, decades of uh, experience uh, um, dr uh, in the Arctic, uh, uh, spending summer weeks with uh, federal field parties, uh, drilling deep into the ice core. Uh, cores so retrieved are analyzed and have generated a wealth of uh, knowledge on past climates and human activity, i.e. industrialization. Ice cores, together with other features, for example, as I understand it, tree rings, whale bones, uh, planetary uh, positions, um, have contributed to our understanding of the uh, climate change we are now contemplating. Um, David has uh, rec he's recognized internationally and, and has worked with scientists from other countries with um, interests in the Arctic. And he has contributed to the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, climate modeling remains a complex uh, subject, but uh, David's talk, I'm sure, will uh, provide us with an opportunity to question the state, current state of science and also to refine our views on what climates are we will be facing. Please welcome David Fisher. All right. Okay, yes, we'll be talking about the, um, the period of time since the nominal end of the last great ice age and what the climate, in particular in high latitudes, has been doing and uh, using ice cores mainly because that's what I've done for most of my career. Ice cores in Canada and Greenland and potentially even on Mars. Uh, okay, so... Uh, right. There we go. Uh, well, 20,000 years ago, uh, Canada looked like this. The, this is the ice, the great ice sheet uh, sitting on top of us. So we had no weather as such and no climate other than that, which was several kilometers in the air. The numbers on there, they're uh, elevations in hundreds of meters. So then the big uh, ice domes, for example, the one over Hudson Bay here, the elevation was uh, 3,200 meters over sea level and, and there was uh, about 30% more in terms of thickness. So there's four kilometers of ice sitting over James Bay, essentially. And over us in Ottawa, there was a, looks like a couple of kilometers of, of ice sitting on top of Ottawa. Some think that's no good thing, really. Uh, so, yeah, and this is what it looked like at the maximum. Uh, and this is just a little uh, PR for ice cores. There's a bunch of them lined up there with my uh, old colleague James Seng in the back. Um, they're very powerful for climate studies because you can get proxies for the climate like the temperature uh, using stable isotopes, uh, precipitation, you can just measure the annual layers. Uh, you can also look what was in the atmosphere at the time because it comes down with the snow uh, attached to the snowflakes or it falls down as dry fallout or it'll even uh, capture bits of air. The ice snow falls in the top, gets amalgamated slowly uh, together and becomes ice and it captures little bubbles of air. So you also get the air uh, history out of it. Uh, and of course you have to date all this stuff um, and there are various ways of doing that. Whoops, went too far. Yeah, this just shows the various places that uh, ice cores have been drilled in Canada. 
uh, up in Aylesmere Island. We've drilled many ice cores, or we did in the, our active years on Agassiz ice cap, and the, just below that in the uh, Prince of Wales ice cap. And then a little island there, Meehan Island, the ice cap there, and Devon Island we've put a lot of holes in. Down the Penny ice cap also, uh, uh, on um, near uh, Pang Nutong. And, um, and also, also on uh, Mount Logan, top of Mount Logan, or the big plateau, which doesn't appear here. And I'll be mentioning also some of the holes that have been drilled in Greenland. These have mostly been drilled by, well, the countries are listed. Uh, Denmark, of course, uh, and the United States are the main ones. Whoops. There we go. These are some of the others showing up. Uh, various places in Greenland. These are quite deep. Uh, they're like three kilometers deep, many of them. Whoops. Okay. Back. There we go. There's the last one up there, Camp Sentry. That's the old uh, American military base that was under the ice put in in the 60s. And I went up there to look and see what was left of it in the 70s, I guess. All you could see was the ghostly ra uh, radio tower sticking out of what was otherwise an endless white ice sheet, this big old radio tower. All the rest of it was buried very deeply. Um, okay. There, um, now they use uh, very large uh, drills indeed to drill um, many kilometers deep ice, but uh, our Canadian ice caps being uh, the usual uh, ratio of one to, one to 10 for comparing the US to Canada, our ice caps are a few hundred meters thick. So that was the ice drill that we used to uh, get the ice, ice up from the uh, few hundred meters thick ice, ice caps. Sort of a manageable thing you could put in a twin otter. Stubborn, there we go. Uh, yeah, it's just a rotary type uh, inner barrel, outer barrel type drill um, with a helix uh, on the inner barrel and the inner barrel rotates. Uh, there's cutter heads that cut uh, an annulus of ice, and the, the chip cuttings go up between the two barrels and get stored at the top of the uh, drill barrels. There's a motor and an anti-torque system at the top, and it's all suspended from a, a cable that goes down to whatever depth the, uh, the active drilling face is. And you go up and down every meter. If it's 400 meters of, of ice you want to drill, you go up and down the hole at least 400 times drill a meter, pull it up, take out the core, down again. So it's a, a slightly rep repetitive process. Uh -huh. So dating ice cores is, uh, is fairly critical. Uh, and luckily, there's lots of uh, horizons in ice cores. Uh, natural ones, there's seasonal variations, like uh, tree rings almost. Seasonal variations in the proxy temperature records, stable isotopes. Uh, you can actually see the different years just visually. Um, also, you can find uh, volcanic horizons. There, there's a fellow uh, measuring the acidity of the ice core. Volcanoes largely throw up uh, uh, sulfuric, uh, not sulfuric, they, they throw up SO2 that then combines with the atmosphere's uh, water vapor and makes sulfuric acid. Uh, volcanic hazes are largely that. And that goes around the world, uh, depending on where it blows up. And that falls down, and in particular, it falls down on the ice caps. So when you measure the acidity along the ice caps, you get a big peak where there's a big volcanic peak. And then if you know approximately what the age is, you can then make reference to the, the chronology for, for major volcanic events. And then you have a, a, ta a dated horizon. That's been a very va valuable tool. Uh, this is some of the th some of the ways, uh, in in fact, that one uses uh, up there in the upper left. Uh, those are annual values uh, in the stable isotopes I was mentioning that are sort of pseudo temperatures. So you get one one wiggle per year. That's useful if it's uh, enough accumulation. And this is the uh, volcanic record from that's from the Agassiz ice cap in uh, northern Ellesmere, and this is from central Greenland. And you can pick out some of the major volcanoes. There's one there, Lackey on Iceland, 1784. And here's a whopper, which was in the equatorial zone at 
uh, 12, uh, 1259 AD. And that's a useful one because it shows up in both hemispheres being on the, uh, the equator. You can see it in the Antarctic even. So it's a very nice marker. Um, you can also just use visual stratigraphy, lower left there. Or um, here, uh, actually it's not quite in, you can't quite get the bottom. But uh, down here is the sort of depth time interval. And this is uh, measuring uh, tritium and total beta activity. That's at about 13 meters depth. And that corresponds to the peak of the atmospheric testing of uh, nuclear weapons back in uh, 1962. That's sort of a handy horizon for many things, uh, th those old uh, radioactive layers. Some of, the, uh, some of the, those layers are so strong in some ice caps there, you really shouldn't be digging those holes. I'm thinking of uh, Novaya Zemlya and the Soviet Union where they popped off some of the big ones. Oh, and this is just typical sampling apparatus. Um, the ice cores go in a sampling vertical container there with a heater at the bottom. Uh, and then you turn on the heater and start pumping the melt into a, a collecting device, small pre-cleaned bottles. Um, and whatever resolution you want, um, you set the heater at high or low. It works out quite well. It did at the time. Okay, yeah, this is just some of the fun. Uh, there's a lot of uh, side, side adventures one has whenever you do field work in remote areas. One's always negotiating with pilots. The only person more important in a field operation is the cook. But uh, pilots are a very close second. And uh, they're not always right, the pilots, but you can't really say that. You just let circumstances prove it. This was one of those cases. No problem landing there. Okay. <laughs> the no ski didn't agree either. <laughs> okay, just some of the basics on what drives climate at this sort of time scale. Yeah, uh, now up here is, this is the solar insulation. There's the time scale back there 10,000 years ago in the past. And these are latitudes, latitude 60 north, 30 north. This is summer insulation. That's how much solar energy arrives during the summer period uh, over the post-glacial interval. In the early post-glacial, like 10,000 years ago, there was uh, up to uh, a 8 to 10 per percent more energy arriving in the, in, in the uh, summers. And of course, that's, that's an effect of the uh, Milankovitch cycles uh, reinforcing each other uh, constructively so you get maximum uh, uh, solar insulation. And that, of course, helped dispatch the last ice sheet because uh, it applied further south, too. Uh, so you get uh, natural reasons for having warm, warm climate in the early Holocene period at high latitudes. Uh, this is the same sort of thing. This is for the summer in the southern hemisphere. It's the opposite. And then other natural things, there's the uh, carbon dioxide levels in the early Holocene. They were back at those sort of calcium values back uh, in 200, 280 and uh, methane. Now, these things you could say, they are drivers, but in fact they're also responders to climate because their sources, uh, certainly in the early part of the Holocene, were largely natural. And as you warm up the world, you release uh, trapped gases and you stimulate forest growth and all sorts of things are then uh, interacting with the gases and the climate. So it's a, it's a feedback that you measure there. Um, and then this sort of uh, change in uh, carbon-14 rate uh, picture there is basically uh, solar activity. The, the strength of the, the solar beam changes naturally through time. Not a lot, just a fraction of a percent. But that can, 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 gets married um, measured by getting a carbon-14 variation after you subtract out the big variations due to uh, uh, systematic changes in the Earth's magnetic field. And then another big driver, of course, is um, a greenhouse, or not green, SO4, a sulfuric acid from uh, volcanoes. Volcanoes, when a, when a big eruption occurs, uh, the, the, the dust and acid veil 
uh, covers uh, the whole top of the atmosphere, top of the troposphere, <coughs> and um, throws back a lot of the solar, the solar beam. So uh, for three to five years after a major eruption, uh, temperatures dip. Uh, there's a measurable dip in the, in the temperatures around the world. So if you have a whole cluster of them, you can make a big temperature change. Okay. Oh, this is just a bit of silliness. Uh, I was involved with Peter Taylor, a CMOS fellow on a Mars mission uh, quite a few years ago in the polar cap, near the polar caps of Mars. So we got into this sort of thing. There's a very nice large polar cap on Mars. It's about the size of Greenland. It's about three, three kilometers deep in the middle, and it's water ice. It's almost pure water ice, and it'd be a great place to, to drill, and there are things there easy to measure that would give you the history of the whole uh, solar uh, insulation history, which, of course, if you have it from there for over 10 or 100 million years, you also have it for Earth, same, same, same star. So I've been pushing that one for years. <laughs> I expect it'll go on my tombstone. Okay, uh, so there's a lot. Of th there are many cores from Greenland and northern Canada, and uh, they don't all look the same in the Holocene. Come on. Okay, I'll just click through these guys. The clicker would. Yeah, these are. From, there's a map over there, and that's what the Holocene looks like. Uh, warm is up. It's in this stable isotope uh, measurement, but. Basically, it's a proxy temperature. Warm is up and cool is down. The, uh, the, end, the end of the ice age was over here, and it was terribly cold to be way down there. But you can see uh, the only two that really look a lot like each other are Agassiz and Renland. Renland's on the east side of Greenland over there, and Agassiz's on, the, on Ellesmere Island. And they're both small ice caps. There, if you lump them all together, you can see it more easily. The blue one and the red one are very similar, and they're the two small ice caps and all the big ice uh, ones, ice cores from deep ice cores uh, on the main ice sheet look f quite different. So there's the, this is what happens if, uh, there we go. So big ice sheets, they're very large, they have a big base to sit on. When the climate changes, like during the ice age, they can expand a lot and they can change their elevation a lot. Little ice caps sitting on tops of mountain plateaus, they don't have very far they can go. They don't have a lot of lateral movement before they fall off the edge. So to that extent, to the first order, they're fairly geometrically stable. You don't have to worry about very large changes in uh, uh, surface elevation. Now if they're surrounded by other large ice masses, you have to correct for depression of the, of the Earth's crust. But if you do that, you get, a, you get a record, this average record here, that's the end of the ice age here, this is an, uh, basically an average record of that Renland and the uh, uh, Agassiz ice cap records. This then is the canonical uh, record of, of paleo temperature at, at those high latitudes. And then the difference between this and all those other ones uh, all over the Greenland ice sheet then has to be the uh, elevation history. And the elevation history you can pull out, it's over there on the left hundreds of meters at those various different sites. The site of the uh, Edge Camp Century, uh, right after the end of the ice sheet uh, departure, or not departure, but the end of the ice age right here. It was uh, over 600 meters thicker at that site. And uh, also Die 3, which is also near the edge, but in the south, it was 400 meters thicker. Uh, uh, so you can extract a lot of information about mass wastage uh, if, by doing this particular methodology. And you can corroborate it actually by looking at the pressure in the air bubbles that are trapped in this space in the central Greenland ice, ice core, and this is from the Cam Century ice core. And, and if they originated from much higher, the air is thinner, so you can extract information about the total air in the bubbles. If it, if it originated higher, the, the bubbles have you know, less air in them. Uh, another very simple thing for, I mean, the stable isotopes, temperature, there's a long string of logic and, and, and uh, measurements between the stable isotopes of, of, of the water and the ice. 
and, and the actual temperature. Here's a really simple one, melt layers. When it gets warmer than zero, uh, it melts, it refreezes. Refrozen water doesn't have any bubbles in it. It's like glass. Glacier ice that hasn't melted, it's full of little bubbles. So you can tell the difference here. You can see the melt layers really easily. Uh, so, and we used to uh, always measure these melt layers uh, every time. And um, uh, fairly recently, like 2009, we went back to all the ice core sites we drilled and went from the surface of that year down to intercept the top of the ice core that we had drilled there possibly decades before in order to bring the record up to the surface. And that's quite useful. Things have melted there a lot in recent times. Here's something, quite a graphic demonstration of it. Uh, this is on the Mian ice cap, and you can see there are three little huts stacked one on top of the, uh, each other. And the first hut was put in in 1967 by someone you may know, B. Alt, a uh, meteorologist. That was when she was doing her PhD. She was going to sit on the top of Mian Island for a long time, so she said, let's put a hut up. So it went, went in there. and. Um, after about 15 or so years, the snow sort of covers the hut uh, right up to the top, and so sort of, let's put in another hut. So okay, we'll use the roof of the old hut. So the second hut was <laughs> in the 70s, and the same argument happened again in the in the late 80s. So come the uh, year 2000 or so, that one was almost covered right up to the surface again. But then come the year 2000 things started changing there rather fast. It started melting like heck. Um, and, and that's what it looked like in uh, 2012 or so. Uh, and then by 2014, it, that, that, that skyscraper hut had melted out even further and it fell over. Other things started coming out also. Um, that old ancient skidoo there uh, Elias and snow machine that uh, my old colleague uh, Dave Burgess sitting on. Now, Peter McKinnon, of course, remembers some of this stuff. He's been in some of these old huts. <laughs> I have pictures of him as a as a callow youth. Yeah, hut number two. Yeah, but B was in hut number one a lot. Now, a somewhat more scientific version, if you take a drill and do the same sort of thing rather than using huts, which is a slightly uh, awkward way of doing it, uh, that measure the uh, ice layers uh, right from the top uh, of, of the ice cap on Agassiz uh, right down to the bed. Uh, and there's the, there's the dates, the age at the bottom. In the early, early Holocene, there's like lots and lots of melt. This is melt, this is a, a ratio of, of um, melt melt to the ratio of the, the total ice core. So it's a mass ratio. 100% uh, means all the ice had melted in the summer and then refrozen. Uh, and, and more recent times, it's quite low, it's 25%. Except when you get to the last 25 years, boom, it's gone up to there. The last 25 years, back, back from 2009. And looking at the last 16 years, it goes up to two line number two, you can trace these backwards in time. You have to go back for the 25 year average, the last one, you have to go back the year 4,000 and 4,200 to get the same melt rates. And for the last 16 years, you have to go back to pretty much 9,000 years ago to get the same melt rates. Now, there was a good reason it melted like gangbusters back then. That was that insulation picture I showed. It was just a 8 to 10 percent more uh, solar insulation being received at the, those latitudes. Now, of course, there is no reason in a natural form. It has to be us. And this is sort of a, an overview of uh, the, uh, the, the proxy temperatures worked out again from this same Agassiz ice cap. The upper value, the upper diagram is the uh, Oh, it's doubled up the, the time markers here. This is the early Holocene. There's the crescent. And this is for the, uh, the melt layer record. Uh, again, the early Holocene showing very warm. There's the crescent, the big spike at the end. And you have to go back a long ways to find similar temperatures. And uh, back in the early Holocene, it was five to six degrees warmer uh, than the sort of 
value here, which is just a low, low value. Uh, yeah, of course, melt layer records have one weakness. When it gets colder than a certain amount, they don't register it because there's no melt. So they just bottom out, which they did there, except for the episodes in particular. Now I have to sort of track my time a bit. When am I supposed to stop? Never. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll keep going. Oh, there was another one here of some interest. Down the bottom, this is Arth Dykes, if you know Arthur. Uh, whale bones. There's really useful uh, because bowhead whales, being mammals, they have to breathe air and they can't infiltrate into the Arctic islands unless there's no ice. So cutting a whole bunch of bowhead whale remains throughout the Arctic islands, just dating them and putting them on a timeline against the numbers in that bin gives you a record of the amount of sea ice in the uh, Queen Elizabeth Islands. So that's what Art did. And it matches pretty well the uh, early Holocene warmth that we get by other means using ice cores. So it's a very nice co uh, a collaboration. And then our po pollen person, Jocelyn Fourth she measured pollen also on the ice cores. And you can also see it was uh, more pollen in the very early days of the uh, post-glacial. Okay. Now, uh, there's scientists love to categorize <laughs> things and uh, make uh, names to put on stratigraphic records. And of course, in the Holocene, it's been it's also been the case, and they've been trying to find markers that are global markers that they can then find other places and 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 to give them dates. So, two of the big markers that are under discussion are the one 8,200 years ago and 4,200 years ago, and some discussion about number three, which they want to call the Anthropocene. Nothing to do with coal, not in terms of naming, but obviously could be to do with carbon dioxide. Um, and anybody who's interested in such things, there's a very interesting paper. That's the acronym. There's the, what it means. Um, very a very int a good paper, I think, uh, by uh, Mike Walker. And um, it's about these, these dates uh, of 8,200, 4,200 years ago. And the 4,200 year ago uh, 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 event is probably it, it, it was, was manifested as a big drought. Been written about a lot by this fellow Harvey Weiss in Yale. And that, that's a book, it's, it's a good read. It connects with archeology span very strongly because 8,200 years ago, we're all still wandering around in, in breech clouts and furs and things, um, not a lot of agriculture. Uh, so we responded. Oh, they, they, there's, uh, there's an example of a lot of uh, stratigraphic records. Um, we're losing the timeline. Maybe can't poke that one up a bit easily. Oh well, not to worry. We'll carry on. Now there's that 8,200 year event that's an ice core in Greenland and it dropped significantly low down which suggests the climate cooled uh, in, in the North Atlantic sector. Another one from Greenland, but you can see there are notable changes in a lot of these places. That's a cave in China where they're measuring the uh, stalagmites. Sort of they make sort of miniature cores into the stalagmite and pull it out. Instead of having three kilometers, you have a, a core this long, and then you sample it with a microscope and tiny little drills and many graduate students. And then you measure the same thing, the stable isotopes. And when you run out of graduate students, then get some more. Anyway, uh, so there are many places that show this 8.2-kilo-year event, and it was almost certainly to do with the uh, glacial uh, breakout of Glacial Lake Agassiz. Uh, 8,200 years ago, there was a mammoth lake around the edge of the ice sheet, trapped in the, uh, the, the depression around the ice sheet, and it's, the lake was separated from Hudson Bay by what the remnant of the ice sheet uh, 8,000 years ago. But about 8,200, it managed to tunnel its way underneath that big ice dam, just because water does that sort of thing. And it broke through into Hudson Bay and flushed out 
through Hudson Strait into the North Atlantic, and that was very fresh water, capped the North Atlantic, and what did it stop? It stopped the Gulf Stream, or almost stopped the Gulf Stream. Uh, and that's what generates, or rather brings heat to the high latitudes in, 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 in Europe. Uh, and that had repercussions in many places in Europe, the Middle East, even at, uh, around the world to China, because that subsidence zone in the North Atlantic is one of the big players in the whole climate system, because it's related to the, the Jeep Courage system that goes all around the world. It's one of the big sort of down subsidence areas for the whole engine, if you like, the, uh, the what do they call it, the, uh, the global uh, ocean uh, current system. Um, so that's the 8,200 year event, and this is the 4,200 year event, and the marker zones for it are the uh, Agassiz ice cap, not the Agassiz, the Mount Logan ice cap, uh, and, and, and the stable isotope record from Mount Logan uh, in the Yukon, and uh, this is another one of these sort of stalagmite records from a, a cave that's called the Malo Cave in northeast India. And they're almost exactly the same date, and it matches a lot of these other uh, uh, other other uh, records in different parts of the world, and and in particular in the Middle East, the Mediterranean, parts of North Africa, uh, and and f f Far East too. And probably it's still debatable what's caused this event, but it's undoubtedly to do with a sudden change in moisture flux. Not because many of the places in the lower latitudes, especially in uh, North Africa and the Mediterranean areas, were uh, were drought, terrible droughts, and it probably finished off the Old Kingdom in, in in Egypt. It was that extra bit of stress that helped take down the Old Kingdom, and the Akkadian Kingdom, which is a, a Middle Eastern early kingdom, uh, it also collapsed, uh, and and. The difference between the 4.2 kilo year and the 8.2 kilo year was the older one, we were all hunters and gatherers. So when times are ha hard and, and the climate changes against you, you just go somewhere else because that's what you do. But for an agricultural community where you've invested with lots of specialist people and, and you have like infrastructure and buildings and fields, when something like that smacks you, uh, your only options are to collapse, basically, and uh, do, do, do the best you can until things improve. And that drought lasted 200 years, so it had a substantial effect. And uh, the reason there was a drought possibly was, this is the, uh, the Logan record. This one here, oh, the times are up here, 12,000 years there, zero is the present. And there's that Agassiz Renlin record, which is the canonical temperature record here. There's the 8.2 kilo year here. And the, there's the 4.2 kilo year uh, event there. Now we think the Glogan record actually is a good proxy for the strength of El Nino, the big uh, Trans-Pacific Oscillation. And the thing that drives that is the difference in temperature at the bottom of the Pacific, Eastern Pacific, and the top. Uh, and if that difference is large enough, there's a natural instability. And you get El Nino, La Nina and that sort of seven-year periodicity. Uh, if the temperature is not large enough difference, you don't. You only get the e endless easterlies, which means strong, reliable monsoons in the Far East. Now, uh, wh we think what happened was uh, 4,200 years ago, that temperature difference got to, got to be big enough. Uh, the, the, the bottom ocean water was cold enough. Why wasn't it cold enough in the early Holocene, that's because of that insulation curve and the sub down subsidence region for producing that deep water is in the North Atlantic. And the early Holocene, it was too warm because of that insulation maximum. So the water it delivered to the bottom water of the Eastern Pacific was too warm. You couldn't establish a big enough difference. But uh, 4,000 years ago, it was cool enough that that bottom water was in fact, adequately cool. And you then kicked into, into play that oscillation between El Nino and La Nina. And when it did it for the first time, it went overboard and produced these huge El Ninos. This is a theory, by the way. Uh, um, and it's, it's not really well established yet, but it's one possibility. 
Yeah, there's the insulation here being occluded at the bottom again, but you've seen it multiple times. Okay, I'll just uh, duck into this quickly. Another thing that's good for, you can get things other than just temperatures and precipitation out of studying paleo records. This is a, a suite, all these dots, there are various types of records. Ice cores are blue, tree rings are the tri green triangles, lake sediments are the red squares. There's some other things too, uh, like there's documentary records. This is a study of uh, sea ice using proxy records, these proxy records. Uh, and that's what comes out of it. The upper, upper one here is, this is the area of sea ice uh, in the whole Arctic basin uh, starting about 600 years ago up to about, I believe it's 2005 proxy. And uh, this, is the, uh, this is the minimum sea ice which you get at the end of the melt season, the end of summer. And, uh, and, and, the, and the modern values, of course, 2000, be 2005. Uh, in 2007, of course, it went lower. In 2012, it went, <laughs> it would be down there, the ridge curve. And these other curves are, this is a, a subset. This is the Fram Strait, I think. The ice cover, yeah, Fram, I think, yeah. Fram Strait, Chuck TC, uh, up there. And then these are some other subsets. And this is the uh, temperature, the paleo temperature record over the same period. And interestingly, this is the, um, sea surface temperature for the North Atlantic and salinity, uh, the bottom one. And one interesting sort of apparent contradiction is the, uh, the little ice age, which the temperature was cold, also seemed to have a uh, 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 just pronounced minimum in sea ice, not the, the big drop. But back here in the 1600s, uh, there was a drip in the amount of sea ice left. Uh, in, in, at the end of summer. In other words, there was less sea ice. You think, okay, it's in Little Ice Age is very cold way, so less sea ice at the end of summer. And the reason probably is there's the, uh, the surface temperatures, uh, the North Atlantic, and the salinities were much higher then. So it's not, wasn't the air temperature that's just driving sea ice melting. It's also the salinity and the, and the temperature of the uh, ocean water that's getting underneath the sea ice. So you're bleeding it from the top and getting rid of it, but you're also excavating it from below. And that, in fact, is probably what's going on uh, to a large extent, also ablating ice shelves. Um, it's not just what's going on at the top. It's these warm water working way out underneath. Okay, the Anthropocene. Everybody likes a, a debate. Uh, so if we're going to call the Anthropocene some layer, some date at which humans take over uh, as a major geological force that's going to leave for all time uh, uh, into the future some layer of our, the start of our influence, uh, what will it be? Well, what, we're, we're producing mass of all sorts that's sort of being layered up in, in sequence. One of them, of course, is lead. Uh, and this is the lead measurements. Unfortunately, there we go. Uh, starting back there in the 1860s, there's the uh, two, year 2000. Uh, this is uh, in Devon Island in Canada, on the ice cap there. Uh, it peaks over in the late 70s, 1970s, late 1979. This is for Greenland, and it also starts to decline in the late 1970s. That was when the uh, uh, it was mandated to take lead out of gasoline. That was one of the big, the big contributors to that. And this is one from the uh, High Alps also. Same story, basically. From the, from the point of getting rid of lead and gasoline, things started falling. Still got a long way to go even now. As you can see the, uh, the pre-gasoline values are here. I'm getting close though. Now, uh, Mount Logan did lead too. It, it's way out of sync. And that's because the lead here, of course, is from the developing economies in the Far East, China, and, and uh, Korea, and, and India. So they're, they're behind us in this matter. <laughs> they're catching up. But presumably they'll learn a lot faster because they've seen where the mistakes lead to. Uh, we all hope that anyway. Uh, but yeah, most of the lead now, uh, 
and the horizon our west coast uh, is not local it's coming from the far east now would we call the uh, the beginning of the lead peak with that lead peak that ended in the 1979 is that a marker but the uh, lead's been around a long time and this is a long record of it 16,000 years end of the ice age this is probably surface detritus just collected because of the melting when you drill through it it's like the spring scum you get on the top of the snow at the end of winter uh, yeah 4,000 years ago the lead started going up so it'd be 2,000 years there's the base level down here. Uh, this, uh, uh, this is sort of a, a marker uh, for, for whether it's natural lead or whether it's sort of unnatural lead. This is say lead that's produced by our interference. Uh, so you know, people speculate, okay, the Romans are visible here in early agriculture in the Middle East, possibly. Now, of course, the lead that we see, and I had in the previous diagram, is this thing right that one last big peak there. Early industrialization may be showing up. Um, so yeah, would, where would we would we pick one of these peaks? The, that's a matter of debate. The lead horizon. Or maybe we could use the radioactive layers. What was the 12,000 yeah. year ago? Peaks? Oh, that was probably because there was, there was impurities in the ice at a very low level. But as you melt the ice down, you leave them on the surface. Uh, and, and, and an ablation surface will get richer in time unless it flows off. Uh, 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 yeah, but it, it just sort of builds up an ablation lag essentially. And then years later, after it's sort of regrown a bit, you drill through it, you get a whopping big peak at an ablation lag. That's what I think it is anyway. But anyway, there's radioactive layers, but uh, and they start quite sharply and obediently in 1945, of course. This is a log scale. This is a cesium-137, and this is total plutonium. You get the same thing. All the major bomb events. Less peak here, of course, and it's 10 times that scale there. That's the uh, 1962, the, the great crescendo just before the uh, uh, everybody agreed to stop blowing them off in the air. Uh, maybe we use radioactivity for, for uh, Anthropocene marker. It's certainly useful for glaciologists. You can still find these things and will do for many years. Or maybe we could use the CO2 layer. That's going to be one of our major uh, uh, markers in the stratigraphic record because this is from the uh, I, uh, CO2 measured in the ice cores in the Antarctic, probably Bostock. And um, there's the ages there. It goes back, this particular one goes back to thousand years. Uh, the present is here, of course, and this, these are projections, all these sort of scenarios. We're up here. We're actually got up to 400 now. Uh, this was about year 2000. I think we're actually measured up to about here now. But this thing will be in the ice, you know, for millions of years. Well, that could be a marker. In fact, it obviously is starting to deviate from the norm. Yeah, it looks like even before 1800. That could be a marker. Or we could use uh, climatological uh, markers. This is a diagram I showed before. This great peak here in proxy temperature will always be there. Unless it ablates away, which could happen. But And this great melt peak will be there for a long time. So we could use just straight climatological markers for uh, definable statistics uh, or stratigraphic start points. So I've come to the end. Uh, it's been an interesting time working on these things, uh, interacting with uh, far-thinking and, 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 and reasonable government uh, <laughs> masters. We learned a lot of really useful things which are summarized here. <laughs> so yeah, things get done anyway. Can you just stay here? Sure.